Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today's conversation is with Alex Potter, the Piper Jaffrey analyst that covers Tesla stock. And he recently increased his price target on Tesla to $423 per share. So in today's conversation, we talk about the reasons behind that. We talk all things Tesla from China to competition to bankruptcy risks to whether or not that $423 price target is even high enough. So as always, nothing in today's conversation is financial advice. Always make sure to consult a financial professional before making any investment decisions. And there are additional disclosures down in the show notes below. If you do follow Tesla closely, I definitely recommend checking out my podcast, Tesla Daily. That's a quick way to stay updated on the latest things happening with Tesla, 10 to 15 minutes every day, available on any podcast platform, including Spotify and YouTube. So make sure to subscribe here for more content like this, as well as that podcast. And with that, let's hop into the conversation. I am here with Alex Potter, uh, analyst at Piper Jaffrey, who covers Tesla. Uh, about a week ago, we had talked about his most recent note on the podcast. And here we're um, going to have just a little bit more robust discussion about Tesla and kind of see where that leads us. So, Alex, do you want to give everyone a little bit of background on just how long you've been covering the stock and maybe some of the other companies you cover? Sure, I can do that. First of all, huge fan. Awesome. Thanks very much for the invitation. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks for coming um, on. So I've, I've been working at Piper now, uh, I guess, 11 years. Um, I started in 2008. And throughout that time, I've covered uh, automotive and trucking, truck-oriented companies in that entire supply chain. Um, I started in Hong Kong. Um, I speak Chinese used to live in China, and so for the first several years, uh, I was covering primarily Chinese companies in that value chain. So um, I covered BYD, Geely, Dongfang, um, a, number of, a number of Chinese companies, and also truck manufacturers, engine companies. Um, starting in 2012, shifted over to the US, and you know, I say we cover these companies, basically that means we write research on them, um, we have buy, or I guess overweight, underweight, neutral ratings um, and price targets. Um, but you know, ultimately, my clients are investors, mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, who uh, maybe they agree with our view, maybe they disagree with our view, maybe they think our price target is completely bogus. Um, the main thing I'm trying to do is help them in their investment process. So. Um, it's less about convincing them to buy Tesla and own it because my price target is right, and I think they're going to make money if they do. Um, you know, obviously that is my price target, and I, I, that is my rating, and I, you know, we we do have overweight rating on Tesla, so that's my official position. Um, but sometimes maybe people disagree. Uh, but even if they do disagree, you know, if I go to China and spend a couple of weeks um, talking to Tesla owners or uh, talking to government officials, um, looking over data, whatever it is, then that conversation can still be valuable to the investor um, as they're sort of stress testing their own thesis. So I've been doing that in the context of Tesla now for, gosh, I don't know the specific year that we launched coverage. I think it's several years. Um, and, and I'm a proud Tesla owner as well. Nice. <laughs> um, so how... I guess you guys have been pretty bullish on Tesla that whole time, or is that more of a recent thing? So when I first started covering the stock, we had a neutral rating on it, and I think that that's sort of a cop-out thing to say on Tesla. I feel like you need to... Uh, it's kind of going one way or the other. I think so, right? And I, I think that either you think it's... Um, you know, going to be the, at, at this valuation, I mean, you can understand why it raises eyebrows. You know, people think that this is certainly if you're using any sort of traditional valuation, valuation metric and applying that to a standard sort of plain vanilla automaker, Tesla does seem very expensive. So, um, you know, if that's your mentality, that's the way that you value stocks, that's the way that you think Tesla ought to be valued, then, you know, you certainly can't look at it and say neutral. Um, and likewise, if you're more in my camp and you think that Tesla is sort of, uh, you know, driving a fundamental change in the way transportation works, um, and that 10 years from now things are going to be different in some pretty mind-blowing ways, and that Tesla is the one at the forefront, you also can't 
look at it with that sort of mentality and say neutral, right? right. I, you know, I, and I think it's either one of those. I don't think there's a lot, my personal view is there isn't a lot of middle ground between those two. So, but nevertheless, we started with a neutral rating because I didn't know which of those two camps I belonged in. And sure. I, I thought that both sides made some pretty interesting and valid points. Um, I bought my car in 2016, August. Um, and that was part of the diligence process, I suppose. That's not the reason I bought it. But, I mean, it definitely fed into, you know, it's like we were talking about at lunch. Like, it, I think if you want to be an educate, make, you know, educated comments on this space without ever having really experienced, you know, whether it's Tesla or not, I just, I, you know, I think an electric vehicle is just in all ways a superior ownership experience versus internal combustion, and that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never go back to owning an internal combustion vehicle, full stop. Yeah. So, um, you know, at some point a couple of years ago, we, we, you know, came over to the overweight can. It, it, that, I mean, we've been overweight ever since then. Um, so, yeah. How relative to, since you've sort of been overweight on the stock, how are you feeling about it in this point in time? more bullish than you've been in the past or yeah i mean so we recently increased our price target on the stock and so 423 right yep um and i think the main thing at this point is tesla has cleared a couple really significant um milestones you can call them milestones whatever it is i they are starting to look and feel more like a legitimate company rather than a cash burning machine which is there were you know for a long period of time Rightly so, right? People would look. That was the primary metric that people would look at after every quarter was the cash burn. You know, how much longer is Tesla going to be able to keep the lights on without going back and raising more equity, whatever? Um, that was a that was a cornerstone, I'd say, of the bear thesis and the incoming call volume with that specific sort of thesis has died down substantially and from your investors. Yep, or clients. Yep. And, um, and it's there, you know, you understand why, right? I mean, Tesla's starting to, their cash flow profile looks a lot better. One of the things that, you know, I don't think it's as much airtime as it probably deserves is they've, I mean, the OPEX control, the, um, you know, frugal on capital spending, CapEx outlays, um, much more efficient than they used to be. Um, and they're starting to produce volume, you know, in, you know, vehicles at scale and make a margin and positive cash flow. Like right. Yeah, I think over like the last 18 months or so, it's, you know, free cash flow has been close to neutral, if not positive. And yeah. certainly they've had quite a few quarters here of positive free cash flow. Yeah. And, you know, there was, that was while building a gigafactory in Shanghai, mm -hmm. which, you know, at, at the time, you know, you go back two years, three years, you don't really know how many zeros you have to put on the end of that check when... You know, they're building these, I mean, certainly if you compare it to what they did in Nevada and what they, what they did at Fremont, I mean, they're getting, and who knows, I mean, we'll see what the price tag is when they go to Germany and start doing this in Germany rather than doing it in China. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, the volume has been there and um, OPEX control has been there and margins are, you know, improving. Obviously, in any given quarter, you could have some, things happen to impact gross margin. I mean, logistics costs and foreign exchange, and and who knows what, credits. Right? especially when you're ramping a new, new factory or a new model and, you know, there's scrap rates and various things that go into the gross margin. Um, you know, and you get a mid teens type gross margin and people sort of freak. Um, but so long as they can demonstrate that those truly are just growing pains and teething as they're coming up the production curve, and I think over the last couple quarters, people have, they've proven, or at least um, maybe not proven, but certainly provided incremental evidence uh, to suggest that, no, this company is going to be around. And they've built a pretty substantial lead over, I'd say, the, the competition. And if you're short the stock and you're thinking about all these things in the back of your mind, hoping that when the financial statements come out, it's going to show, you know, a catastrophic burn rate and, you know, margins coming apart at the seams and 
all these things, you haven't been able to have any of that ammo right. recently. And that, I think, eventually that happens quarter in, quarter out, and you wonder what you're doing, um, staying short the stock. So now I think the question is, if you can take that part of the bear thesis off the table, then it's, okay, how, how high can Tesla's market share go? Is there a natural ceiling to it? I mean, obviously, there's there's only so many cars that are sold every year, so yes, there's a natural ceiling to it. Right. Um, but um, you know, is there a reason why their market share can't continue rising? Um, is there compelling competitive offering? And like the things we were talking about just a second ago, um, you know, China at this point, China's the biggest biggest car company or car company car <laughs> car market in the world yeah. um you know more luxury sedans sold in china than anywhere else so clearly it seems like with model 3 they're attacking a very compelling huge market but we don't know really at this point if they can go in there and just nuke the incumbents like they have in the us or or europe there isn't historical precedent for that. Um, and so those, to me, uh, are more compelling. Like, if I was looking for a reason to poke holes in my own uh, thesis, it wouldn't be, you know, whatever. Elon Musk is a fraud, and he's out there trying to fleece people and playing games with accounts receivable or, or, or whatever, you know, like there's David there, Einhorn shout out right there. <laughs> yeah, he, he was questioning that. that in his like oh, really? letter to, uh, <laughs> to Elon. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you do get, yeah, for a, for a period of time, like that was, uh, you know, you would hear people would send me a photo of like a bunch of model threes parked in a lot or something and be like, Oh my God, like, look at this. They're, they're selling cars and like, there's no buyer or, and it's like, okay, I, you know, that's not, I honestly, anybody who thinks that Elon Musk set this company up in order to dupe people and like steal their money or play tricks with financial statements is really pretty far off the mark, I think. Like, it's not to say that there aren't going to be stupid mistakes that they make along the way. But, sure. Um, this would be one of the longest cons ever. Like, if that yeah, was his intent, he should have bailed a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I. I think that a lot of that, um, if, like I said, if it were, if I were trying to find problems with my thesis, um, it would be less that sort of nefarious accounting yeah, based you know, things. Um, and it would be more, can Tesla sell cars in China the way that they've done in the U S I mean, they go again, like we were talking about earlier, I think people at this point have come around to the idea that Tesla, when they choose to target a segment, they will go to number one and they will make everyone look like idiots along the way and in short order, right? And it's amazing how quickly they, you know, Model 3 and I'm sure Model Y will eventually do the same um, in the segments that they target, but that's not in China. And, um, some of the reasons, the reason I bought a Tesla, I was never in the market for buying a car with that sort of price tag. It's insane. Um, we owned a Prius. Um, but I think Tesla as a brand, Tesla as a company, as a mission, all of these things really resonates with a certain constituency in the US and in Europe. Um, and obviously there's going to be some people who like it because, you know, whatever, you can take it to a drag race and, you know, Beat a Ferrari. Right, kick the crap out of a Ferrari <laughs> yeah. or whatever. And, and people like that, right? yep. regardless of what the drivetrain is. So it's, I don't want to say that I'm the only type of buyer out there. That, For sure. And there's the but, technology appeal. It's new technology. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds yeah. of, you're on the bleeding edge and yep. there's, there's a lot of reasons why people embrace it. But, you know, I mean, the fundamental reason that Tesla was formed, right? If you take Elon Musk at face value, and this is something that I do think you should pretty much take to the bank. I mean, he set it up because he thinks global warming is a thing and we ought to be pulling our weight to try to solve it. Mm -hmm. And um, that resonates. Uh, it resonates with me personally. And 
I think it resonates with European consumers. I think it resonates with American consumers. And it gets people to do things that, from a financial standpoint, they never would have done in the past, ever. In China, that whole value proposition might fall flat. Uh, in China, you want a spouse. Like, that's your primary objective. And the BBA, so that's what they call them in China, the BBA brands. So BMW, Benz, Audi, okay, BBA. Um, they are, you know, seventy-five percent of the luxury market, and everybody else in China, JLR and Cadillac and Lexus, they're basically all just six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, they're they're luxury and they they're priced at a premium versus whatever a Buick um, or or a Volkswagen, but they don't have the same sort of proven ability to demonstrate that you as a human being are a attractive spouse. That's what the BBA brands bring to the table. And uh, so from your point of view, the question is kind of if Tesla can slot into being one of those brands. Right. And um, there's going to be a lot of things that Tesla has going for it that these brands don't, um, particularly as it relates to, uh, you know, the government trying to make life easy for Tesla. Um, if you want a three series in Shanghai or whatever, in any of these cities that have purchase restrictions, you can't buy one. Uh, but if you want a th Model Three, then you can. So you know there are going to be. Situations like that where um, Tesla is just a more compelling choice and it's a viable option because um, some cities, right, because of congestion and things like that, it, they, they have lottery systems or a quota system where the license plates aren't available to anybody who wants them. Um, you can circumvent that, not just with Tesla, just any electric vehicle or new energy vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, so, and there's going to be a number of other sweeteners and things that the government because of Tesla's commitment to China and, and their local manufacturing and all these things um, that Tesla will be able to benefit from in ways that the BBA incumbents will not. But that doesn't address sort of the core issue, which is, you know, the reason that Tesla is where it is today in the US and Europe has nothing to do with $7,500 tax credits, in my opinion. Obviously, it doesn't hurt. Um, and it definitely was a help, but you could pull the rug away and we are pulling the rug away, right? I mean, we're seeing, and demand won't go to zero, right? But in China, what we've seen historically is that a lot of the electric vehicles that are being sold, demand does go to zero or it goes pretty close when the government pulls the hog trough away, right? And so the end goal has always got to be to establish a brand, a product that people want. And the BBA brands have done that. Um, and it's a question, and I don't know the answer, like our, our starting assumption in the way that we build our forecast is that Tesla doesn't even get close to the sort of market share in these segments that it gets in the US. Um, I would like nothing more than for that to be wrong. Um, you know, we'll see. So I guess, obviously, in the Tesla, in the markets that Tesla is big in, brand is a big strength for Tesla. And I would say it's environmentalism plays a role in that. But I think it's a pretty small role when you look at probably the aggregate of sort of purchase driving decisions. And, you know, it's tough for anyone to put their own percentage weight on all those factors. But mm -hmm. I think the appeal of the brand is very techno technologically driven. It's new newness driven. Um, you know, there's the Elon Musk factor. Mm -hmm. I think it's just seen perceived as a cool brand. Um, so when it comes to potentially attracting a spouse, do you think it's more of like an awareness thing where if you have a BMW, you have an Audi, um, that's an immediate sign of like, okay, I know with certainty sort of like the level of person that this right. person is versus a Tesla because there's not sort of that awareness out there yet because it is a newer brand that it doesn't like immediately bring yeah. that to mind. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. Like I, I'm, 
I'm not trying to uh, put forward a specific thesis like I know the way people are going to react. I, I just, this is something like that keeps me up nights um, with an overweight on the stock. My assumption is that Tesla will be quite successful in China, maybe in market share terms, like I said, not quite as successful as it is in the US or Europe. That doesn't mean there aren't versions of reality in which they are, right? right. And, and then some. And a lot of the things that you're talking about there appeal, especially to the younger, affluent, urban type buyers. There are others, um, you know, sometimes maybe you're not necessarily trying to appeal to the urban, affluent, younger buyer. Really what you're trying to appeal to is that person's in-laws. Because they're the ones <laughs> who, you know, are judging. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's a, in a lot of ways, I think that um, Tesla has some advantages in China, just like they do in the US. I mean, certainly nobody comes close from the spec. I, they're, they're miles ahead. And you can look at it in terms of TCO. I know people do that. Um, and it's accurate. I, after having driven a Model X for the last several years, right? I mean, it's, it's fantastic. And the things that people with internal combustion engines have to do, uh, you no longer have to do. Right. And you, you, you don't notice that you don't do them anymore until you start driving a Tesla and then right. you realize how much, <laughs> life has, how much life has improved. Right. When you have um, to go back to doing them temporarily, right, which right. you were talking about earlier today. And, yeah. yeah. And the thing that I think uh, is so fascinating is Tesla, they were sort of the only game in town for the longest time. And now that you have these other sort of companies showing up with their own electric vehicles, and in China too, right, you have a, a lot a lot of them. Um, but none of them re really stack up. So right. if you're going to have an electric vehicle, um, I don't know why you would be buying anything else. I mean, I, there are, there are other, you know, decent, I've, you know, we cover Neo. Um, I've test driven Neos and gone to Neo houses and, um, you know, in a lot of ways, Neo too, right? That's a, they've got, you know, a, a much different sales model. They are more urban, sort of more hip and trendy. And, you know, unlike Elon Musk, they, you know, are Chinese. So, you know, if you wanted to stream, you know, or watch the Cybertruck thing on YouTube in China right now, you can't because it's blocked. And like following Twitter and, you know, the, all of these things, like that's, it's harder for a Chinese consumer to be swept up in the Tesla craze just because of the language barrier and because of, of internet, uh, they call it the, the great firewall. Um, and so Neo doesn't have any of those issues, right? They can go directly to the customer speaking their own language with a homegrown brand and also a premium product. And, um, you know, in theory, they should be able to sort of tap into a lot of the same sort of technological stuff but I mean, the spec is not close, right? And um, you know, there—I don't know. I mean, there's there's a number of different reasons why why Neo and Tesla really sort of don't, at least right now, don't belong in the same sentence. Um, but consumers maybe don't know that, right? And just I think. Um, We'll see. I, I do think there's a lot of reasons why Tesla should be able to go to China yeah. and, and succeed. Do you get the sense from conversations you've had with people related to the Chinese market if there is more of a, an appeal for like those foreign products? Because I feel like my perception of it has been, which may be inaccurate, at least in the past, just thinking back to like Apple and stuff, I feel like there was like a lot of attention given to Apple because it was a foreign brand. And it was kind of seen as kind of like that cool like American brand, is that, has that faded somewhat or is that even maybe inaccurate? And maybe no, how does that apply I, to Tesla if, if at all? I think it, it does. But so generally speaking, if you look at the Chinese auto market, it's a complete bloodbath. Like there's no market in the world. It is the largest, right? They have, you know, whatever, 20 plus million units sold. 
um, 22, 23 is what it peaked out at, depending on how you define the passenger vehicle market. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I think it's in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 plus percent of that is vehicles that are 80,000 RMB or below. And that, so you divide by seven. So, I mean, that's like whatever, 10, 11 grand and below is a quarter of the market. Um, there is almost no analogy for it. Like that type of segment hardly even exists in the, I mean, these mm -hmm. are cars that have like no radio and like windshield wipers optional, <laughs> you know, like it's like, and so very, very uh, low end. And that's the, you know, some of them are four grand, five grand to, you know, new off the lot. And you can't buy a $5,000 vehicle that's new off the lot in the U.S., even if you want to. Um, so you have a huge chunk of the Chinese auto market, which you can basically just cut off that 20-plus million, you know, SAR. Um, and then you have a whole bunch, and most of those are going to be domestic brands, right? There's not going to be any foreign branding in there at all. Right. It's just dozens and dozens and dozens of cats and dogs who you've never heard of mm -hmm. and probably never will heard of, hear of because they're all going to go out of business. Um, then you have sort of one tier up from that where there are some Chinese domestic brands that have started to distance themselves in terms of legitimacy, I think, in the eyes of a Chinese consumer. <clears throat> um, Geely, Great Wall... Uh, probably BYD, they've started to consolidate those lower end segments while all these other companies die off. Then you have one tier above that, which is the, I'd say like Chevy fits into that. Um, Ford probably fits into that. The French brands fit into that. Um, and it's a really tough existence for brands like that in China because they're starting to butt up against and compete against decent like crossover type company you know from like a Geely type of a company Geely can come in or Great Wall can come in with pretty big volume in the SUV market and a compelling price point and you know infotainment from Harman or whatever and people will look at it and say you know why what what, what am I paying this premium for Ford or, you know, for, for Peugeot or whatever? Like, mm -hmm. I don't, there isn't really a reason why I would do that because it's not like I can drive home for Chinese New Year with my head held high uh, talking about how I've made something out of myself if I'm driving a Peugeot or a or Ford. Like, you don't have that. And so you would just choose a great wall. Right. One step above that is... Um, like the Volkswagens, Buick, um, and increasingly some of the Japanese brands, um, Nissan, Toyota. These, these, those cars um, are, you are somebody if you're driving them. Um, and th it's really hard for the Chinese to bust in there so far. Um, they're starting to, like Geely has Link, Link & Co., um, there's a couple new brands. They're like more premium brands. Yeah, they're they're positioned as a premium Chinese brand, but it's still sort of an open debate regarding. And Geely actually, I mean, they bought Volvo, right? So there's some Volvo DNA in there, and they're starting to push into that market. But they're really one of the only examples of a company that's made sort of an honest effort amongst the Chinese to get into that level of the automotive market. Mm -hmm. Everything above that is 100% foreign 100% of the time. And there's no room for a Chinese company to elbow in there. Um, so then I feel like that does potentially end up working towards Tesla's benefit then. Yeah. Since they're I, obviously in that segment. Yeah, I think that there's, and again, this is something that we've also talked about, or we talked about at lunch. Yeah. I think that because of the ignorance and the just in general society regarding electric vehicles, people will lump Tesla in with other companies because they have an electric drivetrain and call them competitors to one another as if, 
you know, the leaf. There's like a finite the, electric vehicle market or something. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, well, you know, either you're a Bolt buyer or you're a, you know, you're a Model S buyer or something. Yeah. And like, which one is a better value prop or something? <laughs> and it's, I think it's completely nonsensical right. to, to even talk about it in that way. And you would never talk about the internal combustion engine market in that way, right? There's segmentation for that reason. You know, you talk about an S-Class versus a 7 Series, you don't talk about an S-Class versus a Kia. Yeah. Um, so I don't think you should do that in China either. And in China, when you think about the electric vehicles that are on offer, most of them are really chintzy and very low end. Um, and they're, sold, they're, they're basically a Chinese version of a compliance car um, that are being built because of a subsidy. Uh, even in the case with like Neo and BYD, because those they both not produce Neo. Neo's pure EV. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, not Neo, but a lot of both. a lot of BYD, a lot of BYD's volume. So we we published some research on this. This is fascinating. Um, you can pull insurance registration data in China. It's a it's treasure trove of data, um, but it's very cumbersome and it's all in Mandarin. But it's a, it's a monthly file, it's 200, 250 megabytes worth of data in a massive Excel spreadsheet that literally itemizes every single automotive transaction that took place in the month. And In terms of sales or in terms of like registrations? It's, or do, do those vary? Yeah, it's one, it's one step down from sa the okay. sale. So if you think about what happens, you've got an automaker, they produce the vehicle, and then they are holding it in inventory, and then there's a the wholesale delivery goes to the dealer typically, right, in a mm -hmm. traditional sense. Right. And then the dealer holds it in inventory and then they sell it and then the end user re registers, registers it. it. Well, in most cases, the registration and the retail sale should happen that very day, more or less. And that's the way it happens in the U.S. But in China, there's all sorts of, you know, funny business that goes on. You know, different people have different incentives, whether it's local municipalities trying to goose their own GDP or you know, companies trying to hit numbers or whatever, they'll shift from one part of the supply chain to the other and it'll get captured in the retail sale, but it'd be sort of the equivalent of me as a dealer or somebody selling you a car, but really you're my cousin and you work in a state-owned enterprise. <laughs> I've got and I'm, my other dealership over right, here. Right, yeah. and you're, all you're doing is parking that car. And I think there is, based on the conversations I've had with people over there, there there's, a, there's a limit to the amount of time you know, the lag that can legally take place between the sale and the registration, but it can be 30, 60 days or whatever. And so this is the insurance registration. So nobody would insure the vehicle. Let's say I was doing that. Mm -hmm. I was just selling this to, you know, play games with my financials or whatever. There would be no reason for you, my cousin in the SOE, the state owned enterprise to insure that vehicle because you're not going to use it. Right. So there's an insurance regulator that goes out and aggregates all of this data, all of the vehicles that are having actual insurance, you know, affiliated with that vehicle. And so you can get all the data. It's amazing. Like there's, you know, the trim, the color, you know, is what sort of drivetrain are we talking? Like, are we talking the performance version? We can, you know, everything you need. Yeah. Um, including imported data. And so, it's awesome. Yeah, it sounds but awesome. One, yeah, but one of the other things that you can get is uh, who's buying it. And so it's not a, it's not, you know, Alex Potter bought it, um, but it's like a classification. There's three classifications. One is an individual consumer, just Joe Schmo bought it. One is a fleet and one is unknown. And so if you look at uh, the overall Chinese vehicle market, all the transactions, regardless of drivetrain, regardless of brand, everything nationwide, it's in round numbers, roughly 90% of the passenger vehicles that are sold are sold to consumers. And 10% or you know, 9 point something percent uh, is fleets. And the remainder is unknown. If you screen for electric vehicle sales, um, pure electric vehicle sales, it's 40% consumer, 25, 
30% fleet, the <laughs> remainder unknown. So my my obvious question here then is what is the unknown category? Any ideas? Yeah, I mean it's, it's just like it's all it's all it's com it's bogus, right? These are they're they're vehicles that are not compelling to consumers that are being produced because the government is basically putting money on the hood. BYD or whoever can get a subsidy that makes them whole. So they're producing a vehicle and selling it below cost, but that's fine because they're getting money on the back end. Right. And they'll sell it to like a ride hailing, like municipal ride hailing fleets. That's a big one. Um, or they sometimes these companies, the automakers themselves, have their own ride hailing fleet. They'll sell it to their own ride hailing fleet. And then they can say we have a fully electric, you know, shared vehicle fleet or something. And then that makes them look really, look really good in the eyes of Beijing regulators. Um, you know, so it, it's a bunch of junk like that. Um, and... And then those file those get filed under unknown versus like fleet. Depends, right? Like I, I don't. Yeah, um, I'm sure there's no way of knowing. But right, and I don't know what the answer really is. But you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's clearly uh, vehicles that are being sold for goofy reasons. And um, I think this is one of the reasons why the Chinese government is starting to taper. The subsidies. The subsidies, yeah. because really what they're trying to do is foster the development, the sustainable development of an electric vehicle industry, um, address global warming, all these things, and in the process establish global champions that can represent China sort of with a straight face on the international stage in this market when really all they're doing is hamstringing their own uh, producers by giving them free money and disincentivizing people to actually innovate. And that's one of the things that Neo, you know, I think credit to them. Like, I don't think they're not playing that game. Like they're making a vehicle. They're basically mimicking Tesla's strategy. Um, it's just that they're, you know, a decade behind or more and they're not novel like Tesla was back then. And so whenever uh, Tesla had issues, you could always find a willing investor or somebody who would say, look, you guys had the gumption to go out there, fight the good fight, put your neck on the line, and that's worth something. The world would be not the same place if Tesla went away. And I, if I have the ability to keep you afloat, I'm going to do it because you're the only one who's, who's you know, got the guts yeah. to do this. And the leader at that time, right. even if it wasn't necessarily exactly. fully exactly. profitable, still the leader. Right. But now you've got all kinds of companies who are sort of falling all over themselves trying to be, you know, like the next Tesla. Like we're, we're Tesla except this or Tesla except that. And it's like, well, we already have a Tesla. And <laughs> like there's really no reason for me to bail you out if you're cash strapped or whatever. And, and that's, the, that's the issue that I think Neo has right now. But their products are cool, you know, in a, in a relative content, they're, they're light years ahead of what most of these little sort of glorified go-karts that the rest of the Chinese supply chain produces. They're not compliance cars. Um, you know, I, they, so I'm not super familiar with Neo, but they've really, really struggled on profitability, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, uh, <laughs> that's accurate. Okay. <laughs> I remember because I've read some comments just on their gross margins, and I, am I wrong to say they have like negative gross margins, like significant? You're not negative wrong to gross say margins? they have negative gross margins. Okay, they, they do have negative gross margins, yeah. and they also there's there's some other things that they do. Um, they they're doing battery swapping, which you know Tesla tried to do. Yeah. Um, Quickly, sort of invalidated that as a yeah. It's, Although, you know, different markets could be different. Yep, it, that's right. I mean, there are definitely different ways. that The Chinese auto market differs in many ways from the U.S. Um, you know, there aren't 75% or whatever it is of the U.S. population lives in a single family home. Like my, I don't stress about charging at all when I pull into the garage and I just plug it into a 220 volt. Like, it's super easy. Yeah. Like plugging your phone in. Yeah. Yep. But nobody, like in China, where everybody's living in these ultra dense urban environments and there are no parking spots with or without charging access, then that becomes a bigger issue. So there, you know, there are, there are big reasons, structural reasons why the Chinese market's different, but, um, 
as it relates specifically to Neo, in addition to the battery swapping stuff, they're also doing, um, it's a very costly retail sales approach. Direct to consumer? Yes. From them? So they'll, they basically what they do is seek out the highest rent district in a city and then they plop down a, you know, like a two story, they call it a Neo house. Is this like a pop-up store situation or is this like a permanent location? No, it's like, yeah, it's, and you know, it's like across the street from Chanel and, you know, Louis Vuitton and stuff. So really, really premium Mm -hmm. experience. And, you know, there's a couple, uh, you know, vehicles on display in the showroom and you can walk in and see it as a consumer off the street um, and poke around and people will tell you about the vehicle, but you can't go upstairs unless you own one. And then when you go upstairs, you know, then it's like they, it's like this own space that's curated for owners. And, you know, there's, you can get a cappuccino there. They, they actually call it a Neo Chino. It's their own flavor. Okay. Tesla's and, got their own little coffee at their, yeah. some supercharger <laughs> stations too. So, I mean, and you know, and then you can go across the street and, you know, there used to be, you know, like in an underground mall, you could see a model three or mm-hmm. something. And so in that context, they look completely different. But the problem is that's not gross margin. That's, you know, operating expenses. And so Neo's operating expenses, um, the gross margin stuff is negative. Right. And then then, then things get really negative when you start layering in, you know, this dozen or so of these in the most expensive, most affluent, most modern cities in China. Yeah. And, you know, they spent a lot on R&D and they were doing self-driving R&D and, and, and these things. Um, so. Also probably doesn't hit their gross margin depending on how they set it up. Yep. I would guess it's like Tesla's. Yeah. So it, it yeah. ends up being, you know, uh, they don't. So back to the point that you need capital then. Yeah, and you need because capital. Tesla exists and versus not existing, right. then it's, it's a lot not. harder for companies. And there's, you know, there's probably a half dozen Chinese companies like this um, that maybe they've got a really good pedigree, you know, they might have really cool designers, they might have really good, um, even a good sense of, you know, sort of where the Chinese consumer's at. Um, Engineering talent. Yeah, and they'll, you know, they'll go to Europe or to the Silicon Valley. A lot of these folks have got, you know, big headcount in Munich and places, people, you know, who know their stuff. Um, But building cars is really costly and really capital intensive, even when, like Neo, you have, somebody else building them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, it, it's tough and yeah. they're all going to need to raise more money. And you've seen, you know, obviously what's happened to, you know, we work and yep. Uber and Lyft and all of these companies where for a while it seemed like there was appetite for growth at all cost type companies. And eventually that appetite dries up and then somebody's left holding the bag. Right. And so we'll see, maybe Neo, Neo can find somebody, um, to invest in them. So what, who do you, so we're both obviously very bullish on Tesla. Who do you view as like the biggest competitor or competitive threat to, th- to uh, Tesla? It's a hard know. question, right? I, yeah, I, I, I know that this is a big, this is a big part of the, uh, of the bear thesis. Competition is coming yep. soon. Right, and so this again, like dot, these dot, are dot. the, I think we've moved beyond, or I think we should have now moved beyond this concept of whether Tesla's real or not, right? Tesla yeah. is They've shown they're their here viability. to stay, right? And more or less self-funding or can be if they choose to be. I mean, obviously there's discretionary things that they could spend money on if they really wanted to, but mm-hmm. again, even that, like, so Tesla's not going away. Now you move to sort of the next level question, you know, what can their market share be? that is a function of who they're competing against. So define competition appropriately. Don't put, you know, some of these other goofy uh, EVs, compliance cars into the, they're competing against other viable ICE based cars. And increasingly they're gonna be competing against other, you know, electric vehicles from legit car brands. And there are many, right? I mean, obviously Volkswagen is, shoveling tons of money. All the Volkswagen brands under that umbrella are coming out with lots of offerings. Um, And I would say that certainly in terms of sort of consumer choice over the next five years, 
that's going to be where te- the, you know Tesla's probably got the most. Um, I think Mach E is is an interesting car, um, and that's probably another one that people will put into the conversation for sure um, when they're and probably to the decide. most directly competitive to date with like the Model Y from a pricing and utility perspective. Yep. Yep. I think for sure. Um, but you know, I, I honestly, I honestly think that, uh, that none of them. And I mean, that's the reason that we have an overweight rating on the stock. Yeah. I, you know, I think over the next, uh, over the next two years, the real proof point is going to be a, they start selling cars in China and get a meaningful share. Um, maybe not 20% or 25% market share in their targeted segments or something. Um, but you know, if you look at the SUV market in China, luxury SUVs in China defined broadly. So this includes, you know, Full size, yeah, full size, yeah. you know, and it's you know forty thousand dollar all the way up to one hundred and fifty, you know, or yeah. like Bentley, Ben, you know, <laughs> yeah, all of the luxury SUVs. Um, the best performing in that segment, you know, you have a couple of the Germans who one model will be, you know, eight, nine, ten percent of the segment. And there's do you know what that is in terms of, of like unit volume, roughly? Uh, Not to I mean, put you we on the have spot the data, yeah. right? I, I, you know, I can, um, in round numbers, right, you overall, the Chinese auto market, let's say you start at 21 million. Luxury as an entire class within that is maybe 15%. Um, and that's so you're at like 3 million then. That, that includes sedans and SUVs. And the SUV versus sedan breakdown, half and half. There's more. Um, there's more sedans. That, that one of the things in China that um, is a really big thing is this long wheelbase version. Yep. Um, you know, people like being driven around. It's a status thing, so mm-hmm. even more leg room in the back. Yep. Um, so that's a little bit different um, in the Chinese luxury market versus the U.S. Is Um, that really just the case for sedans or is that longer extended wheelbase also apply to like the SUVs that are it's it's the it's the case for yeah I mean if you look at all of the all of the high selling segments um, in China it's interesting like there will be you know like the things that people are used to seeing like uh, A6 Audi A6 in China they call it an A6 L and so you see the and L is long wheelbase, right? So mm-hmm. you see the L on lots of different luxury vehicles across different segments. Um, the thing that really got it started, though, I think, was like the limo type sedan, like where right. you have a driver and you're being driven around. Right. Um, is that a status symbol having like an L on your badge? Uh, I well, yeah. I mean, to people, some extent. Yes. I mean, it again. It all f- sort of flows into this. You know, using a car as a very direct, you know, maybe in the U.S. people, if you really prod them, people will acknowledge that, you know, I bought this German luxury car in order to demonstrate that I am a high quality individual in, you know, my place in society is better than yours. But people, I mean, that's not something that people will outright yeah. acknowledge. Like that's sort of not a very PC thing to say, right. even if it's sort of true. Whereas in China, people won't dance around it. Like it's like, nope. <laughs> That's why, I've, and so, and I don't know. I, it'll be very interesting to see if Tesla, how Tesla performs, though. But anyway, coming back to the original point, right? You have competition um, over the next couple of years. Uh, I think that because of Tesla's head start uh, when it comes to the drivetrain efficiency, when it comes to uh, the battery tech, cost of manufacturing, the cost of manufacturing, the charging network, the over-the-air updates, Autonomy which everybody else is still trying their damnedest to <laughs> replicate. It's just hard because yeah. the, the traditional way you build vehicles is you've got a, you know a bunch of different people from the supply chain and around the table, and you know you can't just do these things over a weekend like the way Tesla has always been able to, mm-hmm. and you know all of those things take so long to replicate. And even if you articulate as an incumbent automaker that you want 
to replicate it. It just takes so long. And yeah, because you need to then coordinate every single manager of every single different team. Right. And, and every time you... It's a new process for every single team as yep. well. And every time, and different suppliers, right? It might yep. not even be different even teams team, within right? your own company. It's diff And you've got to have all that coordinated. And that is a you know, a time consuming process. And right. by the time you're finally able to come out with something that sort of looks like what Tesla was producing half a decade ago, there are already a couple iterations ahead of you still with more functionality and better range and better efficiency and, you know, a more expansive charging network. And it, like, it's just, I don't know. I think that <laughs> any rational, so we'll see, you know, yeah. two years down the line, um, we'll see. But I think a lot of the initial the initial products that we have on offer now that are sort of the in the first, the first foray, shot at, yeah. yeah are are they would have been cool 10 years ago mm -hmm. and in, yeah like the mach e like even you know five six years ago that would have been an amazing vehicle yeah, yeah i mean but, 10 years is maybe yeah. and and i you know i don't want to say anything i think the mach e is a cool car yeah. like i i think it i think it really is but like if you sit down with it and look at Compare spec what for spec, utility get. for utility, right. price for price. With a Y instead. I mean, Mustang has a legacy, like there's something there, and, you know, uh, the Model Y doesn't have that, and maybe there's, and there's also like a, a Porsche enthusiast who really likes Porsche, you know, that's an awesome car, mm -hmm. the Taycan. Yeah. Right? And, it's not, I'm not certain whether they're really poaching. I think they're probably just getting a historical Porsche buyer to buy a different Porsche mm -hmm. instead of buying. A yeah, there will be some, but to the extent that it impacts, you know, Tesla from a business standpoint, probably pretty minimal. Yeah. It's I, just so not as compelling. I mean, so just today, I don't know if you've seen this yet, probably not, but the EPA rating for the Taycan Turbo, which is the higher range variant between the Turbo and the Turbo S. Yeah. That came out, it's 201 miles yeah. EPA. So it's like 258 on the WLTP European standard, but 201 miles for $150,000 versus you can buy a Model S performance, gets better acceleration, you can argue, you know, Nurburgring, whatever, for $100,000 and you get, you know, <laughs> literally more than 50% more range Yeah, for a two thirds of the cost. It's just, so, I think the competition could actually end up being a good thing for Tesla in terms of like the stock value because I think it just show demonstrates Tesla's lead. Well, yeah, that it erases be, some of that question when, of like competition coming. If we're two years down the line, three years or whatever, and a lot of this, you know, the 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 tsunami of competition that's coming that will, you know, <laughs> supposedly kill Tesla. Right. Um, if it hasn't, like if these vehicles fall flat and the automakers are left with redundant product lines and you know margins that are getting destroyed and no ROI on what they've been spending for the last five years. Increasingly stricter regulations. People will sit there and suddenly the math looks so much different. People say, okay, well, how much of this 16, 17 million SAR in the US or whatever, you know, 20, Five million in China by then, whatever. How much of this is really a potential shot on goal for Tesla? Maybe it's a lot bigger than what I thought because these other folks aren't really. And I don't. I'll I'll be very interested to see what the profitability profile looks like of any of these things. I, I yeah, and I don't think imagine. we're going to find out for a long time. I'm sure they'll keep that stuff hidden. I think it will be. But that's be another really factor tough. too. They can yeah. offset some of the you know, lower pricing of their vehicles through the acquisition of certain credits that then can offset, you know, their internal combustion engine vehicles. Tesla doesn't get that benefit. This, well, one, they do to some extent. But. One thing that Tesla will get, and this is another thing that I don't know. So China in particular, but also in Europe, right? They're, they're moving toward this quota system. Like the ZEV credit system. Yeah, it's very similar yep. to ZEV credit. Now there's um, debate uh, regarding how effective that system has been. Um, I used to cover a company called Navistar, which is a diesel engine, um, well, they're a truck company, but they had diesel engines. And when the EPA 
uh, came out with their sort of first round of pretty stringent diesel emission standards, um, there was a sort of cavalier management team at Navistar who said, you know, these emission standards are coming down the pike and there's lots of expensive ways that you can meet those standards, but we've got a cheaper way to do it. And, you know, you don't need to use all these fancy exotic solutions, selective catalytic reduction, all these things that other companies are trying to sell you. Just stick with us and we'll make you whole um, without having to spend lots of extra money. But what happened was it didn't work. And so they were not in compliance with the new emission standards. And the EPA basically, you know, there was a red line. And if you're not in compliance, we're going to fine you. And what happened was Navistar, basically because the EPA took those red lines seriously, Navistar almost went away. And it was a, you know, Neo, maybe not quite as big, but in the same ballpark as, you know, Neo's current financial situation. Tons of debt, a huge underfunded pension liability, and massive fines. And that was all because the EPA took those regulations seriously. Caterpillar used to make truck engines, and they got out of the business entirely because of that regulation. So in the context of these ZEV credits and quotas, in China, the unknown is how seriously China is going to take their own quotas. Because I don't know if you've seen the, they're, they're putting some huge numbers out. Yeah, I actually just did an episode a couple of days ago, just kind of reviewing what I could get from Google Translate, which is not as robust as what you would understand, but in terms of just like the credit buildups requirements yeah. that they have. And then I know there's like the average fuel consumption requirements yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, you'll get yourself run in circles trying to understand a lot of it. And yeah. part of it is because it changes all the time. Like there's, um, yeah, like every six months, it seems like, yeah, almost. Th- but generally speaking, at least more th- most recently they increased the, uh, so it's just a couple of days ago, right? They said, mm-hmm. okay, 25% by 2025. So I do have a question on that. I don't know if you'll know the answer for sure. A lot of people have been reporting that as literally 25% of vehicles need to be, you know, new energy vehicles. But is the actual percentage, is that actually credits? Because I know you can earn like two to five credits, two to six credits, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. I, and that's my, like my interpretation is that it's the credits. Okay. But, Same but, from what I could understand. Yeah. I mean, so like, you know, this year it starts at 10, 10%. Right. 10% need to be accumulated in these credits. Right. And, but different vehicles count for a different number of points. Right. And that's very, very convoluted formula yeah, to get to God, that. Yeah. It's a, such a, Generally speaking, you're better off if it's a fully electric vehicle and if, if it has a lot of range. Yep. Then you can get, you know, I think the max is five points. But again, like I'm not even really sure because they, they keep changing. I've seen five and six. So yeah, I'm not sure either. <laughs> and I've seen some versions where it's like, no, now the and max then there's is like three drafts. And, a half, and then there, yeah, there's plug in hybrids. And, and so I don't really know in the end how you get to you know, 10% or 12 or, you know, what the, what the exact, co- and I, I don't think the supply chain knows either, but generally speaking, the direction is clear, right? The Chinese it's government, increasing. somewhere out there, there is a, you know, an EPA-esque red line. And you as a vehicle manufacturer must, just like Navistar must adhere to these new emission standards, you must have a certain amount of your production that satisfies, uh, you know, these requirements. And those requirements are getting more and more stringent by the day. Mm -hmm. And even if it is, you know, let's say the 25% by 2025 actually equates to 12%, 12%, something like that. Who knows? That's still a huge ask. Mm -hmm. Like even when the government was shoveling money at this market, basically giving electric vehicles away for free to Cousins and biased municipalities and things like that. The best they were able to to get was, you know, five or six. And that's in, like, the best months Mm -hmm. when the subsidy is just about to expire and everybody runs out and does it. So in order to get from here to there, you need vehicle manufacturers putting electric vehicles in showrooms and selling them and not selling small numbers of them. Yeah. That are compelling, that don't right. need to be... There is going to be no subsidy. Right. 
that like that's the the subsidy's gone away and it's being replaced by a quota system. So it's on you, Volkswagen. If you sell millions of vehicles a year, and you know it's ten percent or something in the zip code of ten percent. I mean, you're talking about selling hundreds of thousands of new vehicles. Just in China. Just in China. Basically, at how long? You know, it's out of nowhere. You currently have no vehicle in the showroom, and these targets are coming at you fast. Yeah, and so, the normal lead time for a new vehicle from these companies is already yeah, you know, many, generally many like years. three, four years. Yeah. So, I mean, they're working hard, and behind the scenes, obviously, Volkswagen is more mm-hmm. probably, be, you know, not probably. I mean, they're absolutely better. Um, prepared for this than a lot, but everybody by force basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you think about everybody else. Like there's there's every single brand in China has to adhere to these things right. so long as the government is willing to take that red line seriously. Right. If they are, and you are, you know, brand X Y Z, and you are Navistar in this case. You know, you tried your level best, but in the end, you weren't able to hit the quota. You can either a buy credits um, from somebody who overproduced their quota, enter Tesla, Tesla. <laughs> uh, or be fined. But we don't know really how this mechanism is going to work. We don't know what those fines are going to be. We don't know how much those credits are going to be worth. And a lot of it comes down to whether the government is really going to treat it like a red line. You could have something similar to what happened with the cafe standards in the US where you know, Obama era or, you know, whatever, several years ago, you had a hundred dollar a barrel oil and consumers wanted it. OEMs wanted it. The government wanted it. Everybody wanted 50 plus miles per gallon. You know, everybody was rowing in the right direction. So Mm -hmm. sure, set a big target out there. We're going to go hit it. And, you know, we're not going to push back. But then eventually the bottom falls out of oil and everybody wants to drive Escalades again. Then you know, the OEMs go to the government and say, hey, you know, like we can't force a consumer to buy something that they don't want to buy. We did our best, came up with, you know, incremental improvements, right? And, but the mix is such that, you know, if people want to drive Silverados and F-150s around, like who are we to tell them they can't? And so in the end, the red line becomes sort of pink and then not really that red at all and then maybe just goes away entirely. And Mm -hmm. my sense is that, if the government actually means business, then Tesla, when the time comes, could be just minting Benjamins at 100% margin. And obviously, everybody always backs that stuff out, and they give Tesla a hard time when there's Zev credits that come in and you know, say it's, it's not real. Yeah. But Tesla could be selling hundreds of thousands of vehicles, which is the, you know, the bogey that some of these other big manufacturers are going to need to hit in China. And in addition to whatever margin they're making on the vehicle, selling these credits. So I don't know. And it, it, who knows? So dot, dot, dot is a great way to put that. Like, do the math. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it could Tesla's be. Tesla's already producing profitable, <laughs> profitable vehicles. Cost on each vehicle is going to come down already from Gigafactory Shanghai. Yeah. Their capital expenditures have been, you know, they say roughly half or whatever it is. So the depreciation per unit is going to be roughly half. Margins yeah. are going to skyrocket. Labor is going to be cheaper there for that component of the vehicle. Like, <laughs> but we don't know. So like, I think I think I think one of the I, <laughs> I, I think all of that is all of that is sort of Tesla in control of their own destiny, and right. you know it's up to them to you know go out and consumers are going to have to buy. That's you know that's I, the main issue I think. Um, so you feel like demand is the primary question mark that sits on Tesla as a business today in China. I don't lose sleep at night at all in the U.S. and Europe. I mean, we did a we did a thing. You know, several every once in a while, this demand thing crops up. Yeah, Q one, Q one mostly. <laughs> yeah, like it's amazing. Like I don't know where this came from. We yeah. published a note at the time. It was like you need to defend the idea that there's no demand. Like you mm-hmm. can say there's no demand. You know, there were production hiccups and all this. Like they were, you know, the batching their production and they had issues with putting cars on boats and shipping them all over to Europe and it was a nightmare and all these things and it impacted gross margin and then people start extrapolating out and saying getting scared yeah Yeah. and so you look basically what we did it was like 200 or something different models in the US and look at in the trailing 12 month period prior to when model 3 was released um, how many of that specific model were sold so how many 
Civics were sold, how many F-150s were sold, right? Um, in, and those are unpolluted numbers because obviously Model 3 hadn't been available yet, so they hadn't been losing any volume to Model 3. Are these just the Dan's you're looking at or across nope, the market? across the entire market. Okay. Every single car that was sold in any volume in the U.S. This yep. is just the U.S. Yep. analysis. And then go down the list making sort of bear case, bull case, base case assumptions regarding what percentage of that buyer, let's say there was, you know, X hundred thousand units that were Camry buyers or something. With some non-zero number are not buying a Camry now, they're buying a Model 3 instead. Um, if it's an F-150, then you can say it's probably pretty close to 0, 0.0 repeating. Like mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of people who were in the market for F-150s who decided to buy a Model 3 instead. It's, right. it's a completely different use case, right? So just do that for every single vehicle. And, you know, without breaking a sweat, I think you can, and actually we should probably redo this analysis and move the bull case higher because at the time I was thinking like, okay, Prius or something like that. Like Model 3 will win a lot of Prius buyers. So let's say like one in five are gonna buy it Model 3 instead. Actually, they completely nuked that whole like demand. Like if you look at what happened to, and it's not just that, like there's lots of different segments, lots of different models that I think for various reasons you can move that conquest number higher. Um, so I, and I, you know, it's the same story in Europe. I don't, I haven't done similar analysis in China. There would be a lot lower, I think, conquest numbers in China for some of the reasons that we talked about. Um, I don't think you're going to get somebody who's in the market for buying a $5,000 car right. in China. That's just not feasible you know, for them. Right, they're yeah. living hand to mouth or whatever um, to instead buy a you know $50,000 car. Right. Um, but you have something that's analogous to that in the U.S. where people maybe in the past they bought $25,000 yeah, cars and now they're buying a $45,000 car yeah. because it's Tesla. Um, mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I should try to replicate that analysis, but China demand is is one area that I think warrants very close attention. Yes, yeah. in the next and, several yeah, months, we'll and learn a lot. We will this, soon. This next, you know, six, nine, twelve yeah. months is going to be so. Since you mentioned the bull case price target, I do have a question. So I think, if I remember correctly, I don't have your model in front of me, but I think you had forecasted revenue out for to like twenty forty or something like that. Yeah. And I think you guys had it pretty much peaking in like 2025 around 80 billion and then just pretty much like leveled off after that. And obviously those out years, there's, you know, much less certainty there, yeah. but that seemed very low to me because you could pretty much categorize that with, you know, Tesla's already announced products. Like you got 50 billion in Model 3 and Model Y. You've got, you know, they're 15, 20 billion between SX and Cybertruck. And then you really only need like 10 billion more from energy, which should be pretty easy for Tesla to accomplish at that point based on Elon's comments. So, yeah, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I think uh, for sure, like I said, I mean, I think a lot of our starting assumptions uh, regarding what they can do from a market share standpoint um, are, well, I don't have license yet uh, to talk about what Model 3 and Model Y could do, particularly in China. Their proof is in the pudding already as it relates to what Tesla can and has done in the US. Um, so that's part of it, right? I, you know, We have their market share in China you know, topping out at half of what it is in the US. Um, so there's that. Um, there's also, uh, you know, no Cybertruck really anywhere except the U.S. True. Um, and who knows? Cybertruck. Even ten billion from Cybertruck, though, I think is pretty conservative. I mean, that's only two hundred thousand a year. Yeah, and we don't have Probably them. Less. Ultimately, we have them getting up to more or less that, which would put them. They'd be sixth, a maybe. Yeah, but, I mean, they're a legitimate. <laughs> part of the conversation in the U.S. pickup market, <laughs> right. right? But not, you know, they're not, it's not like they're coming in and torching Silverados and F-150s in that right. scenario. 
which they've done but, in other markets, as we've yep, talked about. Yep. And they've, you know, they go right after the meat of the, you know, the the most important segments for their competitors and then make them look like idiots. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not explicitly modeling them doing that in Cybertruck. If they do, that would certainly be upside. Um, to what, and we, like I said, I, we don't really have them selling it anywhere in, in the world other than the US, which mm -hmm. they probably will. Some volume, but yep. not huge. Um, yeah. Energy, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> so um, I think, uh, I want to be able to, like, if we pull the model out and go through all the explicit assumptions in the auto business, I can articulate and defend them. Um, they may be wrong, but at least I know why I'm wrong and where, and I can rationalize why I'm putting those numbers in the model. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about with the China stuff, like you could, there's a market share out there, you can apply a certain right. percent of certainty right. to it. And, and you know, then you make your, your margin assumptions and your right. pricing assumptions, and, and you can get to something that resembles a defensible cash flow forecast that you can then discount and value. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a ton of wood to chop as it relates to doing that work in the non-auto business. Um, I'm in the process now of renovating our house. We're not putting a solar roof on. Um, it's a flat roof. Do you guys consider it? Oh, flat roof. Okay. Yeah, it's flat roof. And um, Minnesota. So in Minnesota, <laughs> but we are getting this. We are getting the solar panels put on. We're going to get power walls. We're going to do, and again, just like when I was, you know, buying the Model X, um, it's diligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you learn a lot doing <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, and yep. so, and there's a lot that we haven't done with regard to the, you know, the grid scale type stuff, you know, the projects they're doing in Australia and and elsewhere. You know. How big is that market? How many gas peaker plants are out there? You know, what's the value proposition and the ROI for utility and what's the whole go to market strategy and the buying process? Like we are not modeling that market uh, as responsibly, you know, as we should. Like if we start going down that path, my value add, <laughs> I mean, it evaporates pretty rapidly. So. Yeah, which I think is probably the case for like a lot of analysts that cover Tesla's, you know, they're either auto specialists or in, in most cases, auto specialists, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit in technology, but yep. a lot of people, you know, I would count myself amongst those people, just not a great understanding of, you know, that energy business. Yep. Is that any part of your price target right now? No, well, very little. And so and I, then like similar with autonomy, we had this conversation with earlier, autonomy. but same like I don't, train of thought because there. I don't know what to do with it. Right. Like it's, so yes, I can understand reasons why, you know, if you look out, to a multi-year, multi-decade type forecast, you know, Tesla's doing things that blow people's minds. And um, fundamentally, first of all, in the market share stuff, even if you don't even get into any of this, just on the virtue of the fact that their products are better than everybody else's, they take, you know, two steps forward for every one step forward everybody else takes, and it's just not possible for people to close the gap. Mm -hmm even if nothing structural changes in the transportation market um, as it relates to ride hailing and robo taxis and things like that. And then, you know, you have their, their autonomy business model, which again, for reasons we were discussing earlier, I, I think that they have structural advantages that um, will, that are hard to replicate for anybody other than a vertically integrated automaker. Um, and there are only so many vertically integrated automakers who are actually Pursuing the market, even attempting it, yeah. right? Most people in the automotive supply chain prefer to do things the way they've always done, which is in the supply chain, right? You've you've got different people specializing in the things that they specialize in, and then they all form a consortium and you then package they, it up and sell it to package them, it the dealer, and then they sell it on to the right. consumer. And I think that that is just, you know, I I'm not a mathematician, and I'm not a I I, I can't. You know, if you show me a bunch of code, I can't tell you which one of these is a superior algorithm versus right. the other or whether simulation works or whether you need real world data or whether you need LIDAR or whether, you, you know, I, I, I know there's debates raging. I'm just not qualified to add anything to that discussion. I can see why Tesla thinks you can do it without LIDAR. I can understand what they're saying in layman's terms. Um, but as it relates to the way their strategy is set up, um, I just think, I remember I used to cover Mobileye before, yeah. before Intel bought them. And they had this thing called REM 
REM, road experience management. Um, it's really cool. It's basically, you know, at the time and still now, right, mobilize attach rates in cameras very high. Tesla actually was originally using Mobileye. Mm -hmm. um, all the ADAS was using, camera-based ADAS was, was mobilized, like yeah. 75, 80%. And so basically what Mobileye's approach was is everybody out there, all these Volkswagens and Fords and GMs and whoever else is using Mobileye, if we all band together uh, and crowdsource this data, then because by virtue of the fact that you have a massive existing fleet, uh, you'll be able to gather data that nobody from Google or Tesla will ever be able to replicate because they don't have millions, tens of millions, hundreds. Of, I mean, there's so many, so many cars out there on the road. Right. Um, crowdsource the data, and this is dumb data. This isn't like you know. It's primarily just you know where's there an open parking spot or you know is there a traffic jam and things and then real. And that's, that's valuable and it's compelling and it's interesting. Um, and it's also one potential layer in the conversation for autonomy, right? And clear value proposition. Clearly it makes sense. Everybody should focus on this and get it over the finish line. The first one, the first OEM to sign up with Mobileye for that was Volkswagen. And the management team just kept coming out and saying, oh yeah, you know, we're working on this, you know, framework agreement with Volkswagen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And you know, it's like quarter after quarter after quarter. It took them forever to hammer out that agreement. Um, and this is just one small slice, right, of the pie. This isn't like the full end game, like we've got a fully functioning robo-taxi fleet and, you know, how are we going to divide up the revenue? How are we going to share it? This was just one small component of it. And it right. took them forever to, to finalize that agreement. Tesla won't ever have to have those negotiations with anybody. Mm -hmm. And just because of that... They pushed their own over-the-air updates out over the weekend. They don't have to call anybody up. They, they're the ones who make the vehicle. Like I said, they, I think you know, structurally, the only one who's truly in control of their own destiny, sort of end to end, yeah, end yep. to end, would be a vertically in integrated automaker. Everybody else, by definition, will always only ever be able to compete as part of a consortium. Mm -hmm. um, which can be suboptimal it can. if you are competing with someone that is able to do it end to end yep. competently. Yep. Yeah. And actually knows how to build the cars right. at volume. Right. And can do. And I, I agree. Like, I understand why most of the time, if you are BMW or you are whoever, right, you're probably not going to get the best semiconductor guy or, you know, the best, uh, you know, Computer vision. Software yeah. engineer, you know, who went to Carnegie Mellon, you know, maybe you, maybe you will, but really those people want to go work in billion dollar startups or whatever and be part of a consortium that deals with you. So most of the time, maybe there isn't really an option for those incumbent automakers. Tesla's an exception. Those people do want to work right. at Tesla. Um, Pretty consistently, Tesla shows up in like those top ten lists of you know most desirable companies to work for. Yeah, and so because like you're part of something like that's a, and there's still upside to the equity too. Like the other automakers can't really offer that sort of deal. Yeah, it's um, well theoretically there is, I I but yeah it's in my a, point of view and maybe other <laughs> obviously, people's point obviously of in, in my point of view as well. Um, yeah, but yeah, so I I think that. And Tesla's probably the only real automaker who can appeal to the right talent and truly with a straight face say, yes, like we can build the vehicle and do the algorithm and custom make a chip, right? And have an app. And, you know, we don't need other players in the supply chain who are specializing in this. Who are then going to commoditize it out to someone else anyway? Right, like we making can, the upside not as valuable. Right, like we we truly can, and maybe they maybe they can't do it quite as well, but they're absolutely going to be able to do it faster because they don't have so many sort of bureaucratic stumbling blocks. Um, 
So, but again, that's another thing. Like you look in my model, like I don't know what to do with any of right, that. It's like not I can include it in your it's press fun target. to talk about, right. but you know, when it comes to be like, okay, well, five years from now, I'm going to put X hundred million dollars at, you know, X percent margin into my model. Like I can't defend it. So, you know, it's just throwing darts and I'd be doing the same thing with the energy business. Um, so we just try to stay as grounded as we can and things that we understand and can defend, build the price target based on that, defend the forecast, uh, you know, and then let leave it up to Tesla to prove us. And the rest is kind of, you know, gravy on top, potentially. Right. right. Yeah. Um, so. Well, we could talk about, I mean, that all day for sure. Um, yeah. But I do think you, we're getting close to our time here. I've so. got a flight to catch. Yeah. Um, but thanks for coming on, Alex. That was a really interesting discussion. I really appreciate the time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime. Yep. All right, thanks. Cue music. Cue music. <laughs>